Now I would like to introduce to you Nancy Berlinger, PhD, MDiv, who will speak on spiritual and existential care. This session is being videotaped for the purpose of creating a webinar making, made possible by a generous gift from the Milbank Foundation for Rehabilitation. Dr. Berlinger is a research scholar at the Hastings Center, an independent nonprofit bioethics research institute based in Garrison, New York. Her work focuses on ethical issues in the organization and delivery of health care, including end-of-life care, palliative care, cancer care, patient safety, and ethics education for healthcare professionals. She has a special interest in the management of cancer as chronic illness. She's currently completing the first revision of the Hastings Center 1987 Ethics Guidelines on End-of-Life Care, co-directing a project on ethical challenges in the care of undocumented patients and working on a book about the ethics of avoidance, known as workarounds, turfing, and other practices in healthcare. She, we're all giggling on that one. <laughs> she also has co-directed several recent projects on the role of board-certified chaplains in the delivery of interdisciplinary palliative care for adult and pediatric patients. She teaches healthcare ethics to graduate students at Yale School of Nursing and lectures frequently in medical schools and healthcare institutions in the United States and internationally. Her current professional appointments include serving as a member of the advisory board for the National Institute of Nursing Research Needs Assessment of NIH-funded end-of-life and palliative care science. She is a graduate of Smith College and holds a PhD in English Literature from the University of Glasgow and the MDiv in, in, in Ethics from Union Theologic Seminary. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Berlinger. Good morning. I'm so honored to be here, although I know you're expecting Nessa Coyle. Um, but everything I know I learned from Nessa Coyle or Betty Farrell, so I, I come by it honestly. So here's what we're going to do in the next 90 minutes. Okay. We're going to first look at spiritual care, and then we're going to look at that existential word that can be so confusing. Um, you know, for, First of all, we have to define what we mean by existential. But first, we're going to look at what is spiritual care, sometimes known as religious and spiritual care, sometimes known as pastoral care, and what its role is in interdisciplinary palliative care. And if I forget to say and hospice care, forgive me, but I'm, I'm just going to use the inclusive term uh, for the moment. Um, who provides spiritual care? What is a spiritual screening, a spiritual history, a spiritual assessment? Some of these words you, you might have heard. Um, what triggers religious objections in healthcare? The situation where somebody says, when a usually when a patient is dying or whether there's a decision about life-sustaining treatment, this is against our religion. What happens then? What does that mean? And what can you do to help resolve or manage a situation like that, which can ramp up the stress when it does happen? So um, that is something we're going to be talking about quite a bit. Um, then we'll turn to existential suffering, existential distress, as it's sometimes called. How does it differ from spiritual suffering? What are some ways to intervene in, in existential suffering? And what are some ethical debates about the use of palliative sedation when existential suffering uh, cannot be relieved by any other means? And then, uh, as time permits, we'll uh, look at some cases. And these are cases that come from, uh, from uh, oncology, from the care of patients with advanced disease. Uh, so I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i got some slides in there that j just say questions every so often. If you want to talk uh, along the way, uh, raise a point of information, whatever it may be, uh, we'll just do that along the way as, as well as have questions and answers at the end. But because we're covering a lot of ground, sometimes it might be easier to ask questions in the middle of things and then we can move along. Okay. So what is spiritual care? Now, now we, we know that the definitions for, from the palliative care literature, you know them better than I. Caring for a patient means being attentive to the whole person. Now, a whole person gets their sources of meaning from all sorts of different places, especially uh, from their loved ones. That, that, that you, you, your, your family means a lot to you. Um, patients always are members of their family, however they define family. We often use the term loved ones because we don't want to limit the definition of family to uh, biological or legal relationships. Uh, where, does, what, where, where else does a patient uh, find sources of meaning? In one of the case studies, we'll see a patient's 
source of meaning in her life was her ability to go to a particular museum as often as possible. That was her connection to meaning in life. Um, what are their sources of peace? What gives someone more or less peace in their life? Um, where are their sources of hope? They are, do not always come from the places that those in medicine may think their sources of hope come from. In other words, your sources of hope do not always come from your doctor or how well your treatment is progressing because, again, we're talking about a whole person and, and people may derive hope from uh, the promise of how well family members are doing, for example. Um, and that also that basic sense of connectedness to others, um, that, that uh, existential suffering often has to do with the, the sense of brokenness, that connections are, have been uh, broken or lost. Um, those of you are, is anyone here from Dana-Farber? Ah, I see a hand. Um, Dana-Farber has done tremendous studies in charting a great deal of this in their uh, Coping with Cancer study, which has yielded something like 50 different papers. And there's a smaller study that they're doing right now on uh, religion and spirituality. And in one of their studies, they asked patients with advanced cancer to um, identify um, on, on using different terms, whether or not they identified uh, with uh, various different terms as regarded themselves. When they were asked about the term spiritual or religious, um, the vast majority of patients either pick spiritual, religious, or both. Only something like 7% of patients said neither of those terms applied to them. Now, it's always important with surveys to, to keep in mind what people were asked. If you'd left out one of those words, you might have gotten a different uh, response. You might have gotten a different response if you asked in a different part of the country. But those, this suggests that these terms are meaningful to patients uh, in the United States, although we certainly don't all agree about what they mean. It's often difficult to distinguish between non-religious and religious forms of spirituality. It's not necessary to do so for the most part. It is important to understand what a patient means by particular terms, but the idea that we can divide up who provides this type of care by saying, well, you handle it if they mention God, and, and we'll deal with the, the other stuff. It, it, it doesn't really work that way because people's lives don't work that way. You know? And patients in particular, when a patient is admitted to a hospital or a hospice, we don't hand them the organizational flow chart and say, you know, this is exactly how your care divides up. So, you know, it, it doesn't really make, it wouldn't make any sense in other parts of life. So it, it, what I think is good is, especially around religion can make people sort of nervous because they think they're um, crossing lines or how, how do I talk about this? The best way to talk about it is to talk about it and to just become comfortable in saying this is something that a patient may or may not bring into an organization. It's something that family members may or may not bring in. And what a family member brings in may be different from what the patient brings in. And yet the family member may be filling out the admission form and checking off boxes about the patient's religion that don't reflect what the patient thinks. So it's always important to get as much of your information about the patient's sources of meaning from the patient themselves, if that is possible to do so. The palliative care plan for a patient who is seriously ill or near the end of life should include opportunities, therefore, for this patient and loved ones to discuss spiritual, religious, or other personal issues in whatever terms are meaningful to them. This may be especially important to have these opportunities to make these opportunities in pediatric care um, because the, the care often involves uh, the care of the family. I mean, it involves the care of the family no matter what, but often the spiritual care will also have to do with conversations with the parents and um, you know, who are asking themselves very profound questions about why this is happening and how they will be able to continue to live their lives as, as, as a couple, as a family, and so on. Um, we did a, a small study recently at the Hastings Center in collaboration uh, with uh, Rush University Medical Center, and we looked at um, chaplains on pediatric palliative care teams. What we're, we're looking at was how was spiritual care delivered on pediatric palliative care teams in institutions where palliative care was relatively well established. And we found, we, to our surprise, that it was almost always by the integration of the chaplain onto the team. It was not achieved by having parallel services of, of pastoral care and, and palliative care. But the chaplain was somebody who rounded with the team and therefore could respond to things as they came up. So it's, it's, it, it uh, is a paper that came out in the June issue of the Journal of Palliative Medicine. So if you're in pediatrics, you might find it interesting.
So uh, many of you probably know uh, this, mentioning the Journal of Palliative Medicine, uh, the, the quality of spiritual care as a dimension of palliative care, Christina Polchowski, Betty Farrell, uh, Dan Sulmazy, um, George Fichette, and others are people who've been looking uh, closely at the issue of spiritual care as part of interdisciplinary palliative care. So this is in your literature, and it's also in other literatures as well. So who provides spiritual care? Um, professional, uh, by which I mean board certified chaplains, are specialists in providing spiritual care in healthcare settings, including during crises, but not limited to crises. One of the most um, important, if you ask a chaplain what they do, uh, one of the most important things that they do is they provide support to the rest of the team. They help people process very difficult situations that might uh, be triggering burnout in other cases. Um, integrating uh, chaplains into palliative care teams seems to be good, therefore, for staff as well as for patients and loved ones, and may pre prevent these crises and standoffs that can happen when there's a lot of family conflict that has a, a religious element mixed into it, in part because chaplains are very comfortable with that language. They can meet the person where they are and, oh, okay, you're hoping for a miracle? Well, let's talk about what, what you mean, and you know, you can just sort of take things down a bit. Um, they can also educate and support nurses, physicians, and other team members as spiritual care generalists, as some of the literature calls it. Uh, you know, because you're not necessarily going to wait for the chaplain to turn up to provide all spiritual care. There are far more nurses than there are any other healthcare profession. So it's important that, you know, um, that people share skills. Uh, one chaplain I know, she said when she was first uh, learning, uh, to, to work in a hospital setting, she would say to nurses and doctors, okay, let's trade skills. I want to be able, when I'm sitting with a family of a dying patient, to be able to explain the changes in the patient's breathing. So can you explain that to me so that I can then translate it for a person who is a layperson? And, and she said to a doctor, and I want to explain to you why when you stand in a doorway and cross your arms, it doesn't work for the patient and the family and it makes you less comfortable. And so let's, let's, let's work on your posture a little bit. So, you know, little things like that, can just little tips. Um, but also, um, one of the things we found from our study of pediatric palliative care is that including this interdisciplinary um, briefing that included the chaplains meant that, and I th th thought this was an important observation, we, we, we um, interviewed physicians as well as chaplains. And the physicians were saying, you know, sometimes because a family was always talking to us about treatment, we didn't know whether we, were, we had their permission to talk about the likelihood of the child's death. What we learned from including the chaplain was that the family was talking about this with the chaplain. So they were getting kind of different cues from different people, but if the chaplain hadn't been in the clinical briefing, we wouldn't have known that the family was, was open to talking about this. We, so so uh, that was very useful for us to know. So let's look at some of these um, tools and, and methods whereby um, we can assess a patient's spiritual care needs um, and then do something about them. The idea of, of, of providing good outcomes for patients would also include uh, good outcomes for spiritual care. So um, who's heard of the term spiritual screening or a screen? Sometimes you hear a, an acronym um, of, of FICA or FAITH or there's a couple of different hope, there's some different ones. Um, it's a triage. It's conducted by nurses, physicians, often residents, and other healthcare professionals. It's a short, very short series of questions, like four questions, to identify spiritual care needs. And ac according to the Association uh, for uh, Professional Chaplaincy Standards, its goal is to get a quick determination of whether a person is experiencing a spiritual, uh, a serious spiritual religious uh, crisis and therefore needs an immediate referral to a chaplain. So if you're only gonna ask those four questions in isolation, you're probably trying to size up a situation pretty quickly. But there are ways, as we'll see, that you can use those questions in larger, uh, more comprehensive and non-crisis settings as well. So, I'm um, sorry about the small type. Um, HOPE and, I don't know if it's FICA or FICA, are two well-known spiritual screens, and there are others, and they're all acronyms of some sort. Um, hope uh, is what are your sources of hope, comfort, meaning? It's that, it's that type of question. The O is 
uh, you know, do you have an organized uh, a, a religious affiliation? Because if you don't have that information or if the information on the patient's documentation is wrong, that could be the source of the patient's distress right there. Um, your personal spirituality, if that's a term that the patient uses, what are the things that give you meaning if, if, the, if it's not in terms of organized religion? And what, from the patient's perspective, are the effects of all this on the patient's health care? What do I need it, now that I'm in the hospital? What do I need now that I'm in the hospice? How do I perceive this? And some people are very concrete. You know, uh, in my tradition, we light candles on Friday evening. I need that. I don't really like the electric ones. I understand about your oxygen and you don't like the open flames, but you know, can we come to some accommodation here? And, and so that might be what somebody wants and somebody else um, may need something different. I was once uh, talking with a patient who was hospitalized over Christmas and uh, he was having a uh, cancer treatment. And he had been, I think he was a military police officer and he'd spent his time all over the world. He'd had many holidays away from home. So the thing you thought was gonna be his source of stress was not because he'd gotten very used to that. The one thing he said was, I'm Episcopalian, I need a copy of the Book of Common Prayer, which is the Episcopal prayer book. If you can get me that, I can take care of myself because that's what I'm used to doing. So he didn't, see, he didn't want a lot of special things. He wanted what he normally did, which helped him feel normal. And, and, and like, oh, that's easy enough. Let's, let's go do that. Let's go make that one happen. So then, you know, you ransack the chaplaincy off and see if you can find one. <laughs> Um, so another one of these spiritual screens, it would be very similar, faith or belief, um, the importance and influence of the faith on your life. Is this just, well, I was baptized 75 years ago, or this is something that is part of my life right now, and it, it has relevance to, uh, uh, to my experience right now. Um, what does my community look like? Who are the people? And that's a useful question. Is it just the person with me or are there people 3,000 miles away who are part of my healthcare um, who I um, want you to know about? And again, how do I want you to address this? All of this is optional. Patients don't have to tell you these things. They don't have to disclose some of these things that are very personal. And maybe during a short-term screen, they don't want to. You know, Maybe that will have to be another conversation. But there are ways of having those. But this is a way of getting a, a snapshot. Um, Christina Pachowski um, is uh, the developer of this particular spiritual screen. And you'll see that in the, crit uh, the credit there, she uses the word spiritual history, which really gets to a, an application of these little tools. A spiritual history, um, which, may, which may be what you as, as um, very senior uh, clinicians are more experienced with, is an interview conducted by a healthcare professional, usually a physician or a nurse, who is responsible for a patient's care. So it might be something that you would do as part of hospice intake or part of a, a more comprehensive interview. Um, its goal is to understand the patient's needs and resources in their totality. Um, these spiritual screening questions are sometimes embedded in a larger interview, so sometimes spiritual screens are called spiritual history tools. Uh, George Fichette, who is a chaplain and a, a social science researcher, um, is you'll see his name on many, many of these um, the articles uh, describing uh, these different tools. And uh, there's a new edition of the uh, psycho-oncology textbook, so he wrote the chapter on um, the use of the, the spiritual history, so you might want to take a look at that if, if it's not already in your library. Now, a spiritual assessment is another term that nurses may or may uh, be less familiar with because it is really a kind of technical way of describing what a chaplain does. Um, it's characterized by active listening, summarizing patients' needs and resources, not a Q&A type interview structure. And its goal is to develop a plan for this patient's spiritual care with expected outcomes. The plan is then shared with a team. So it's not just happening on sort of a parallel track. Um, so that's, again, a good reason for why to involve the chaplain in the palliative care team so that they can get that information to you and you're not you know, working at cross purposes. Um, so what chaplains do is they sit, and what, what a chaplain would say is we sit down and shut up. You know, they, 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 they're, they're very highly trained listeners. And, and for some people, they just want to tell you about what's going on that day with their family. They miss their dog, whatever it may be. And sometimes there can be some short follow-up. You know, look, could we get the visiting dog in to see this patient or whatever it may be? 
But often there are these very deep kinds of conversations, because, in part because a chaplain isn't there to do any medical or nursing intervention. They're really just sitting there and, you know, whatever you want to talk about is fine. Um, not there like social work to solve the problem, but, but although obviously there's a lot of listening that goes on across palliative care, but sometimes people want to talk about some um, very, uh, very profound things, but also some things that you, 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 um, you see some commonalities. I, uh, for a number of years, was a, a lowly volunteer on the pastoral care service at Sloan Kettering. And one day, and I always worked on the, the, the breast and reproductive uh, cancer floor, and one day I talked to three women, uh, diff totally different religious traditions, and each of them ha was worried about the same thing. They were all active in their church's um, committee that visited sick people, and they were feeling that they were letting the sick people down by virtue of you know their oncology treatment. And by the third woman, I was like, you know, it's no there's some other people it would be good for you to meet, you know, because it was, it was uh, without disclosing anything about the other patients, it was very interesting that this was a common concern um, expressed in different ways, but also say, but it also gave you a way to say, okay, obviously that's meaningful. You're feeling guilty. And, and yet, you know, the idea of being a giver of care and a receiver of care was something that they all in different ways wanted to talk about. So, you know, but you had to sit there and listen long enough for them to actually talk about that was this on their mind and was this something that somebody in cancer care really cared about hearing, you know. But it seemed to, it seemed to be helpful to them because it was, in some ways, this was something that was weighing on their minds. Um, any questions about any of this? Anything immediate? Any, any experiences that anybody wants to share with uh, working with these tools? Onward we will go then. Okay, religious objections and spiritual care. Dealing with religious objections is part of providing good spiritual care. When an ob objection to making a decision concerning life-sustaining treatment is presented as a religious objection, the classic, this is against our religion, the healthcare team needs more information from the patient or in the case of a patient without capacity from the patient's surrogate about the nature of the objection. An objection framed in religious language should never stop conversation. This is not something that suddenly goes to legal or risk management. That would be a terrible thing. You want to find out what are the, what are the, what are the emotions that are being expressed and why are they being expressed in these terms? There's probably about three different you know, large categories that we could put these into. One is, it really is our, against our religion, we think. And the we think is because sometimes people have misinformation about their own traditions. And it's not too surprising because you don't make decisions about life-sustaining treatment every day of your life. If something happens, I will lose my faith. And, and that is another uh, uh, trigger. And another one is, things are going too fast. As, as a, a chaplain I was talking to said, the effort to control time, to say, if I can say, I have to go talk to my pastor right now so you can't do anything, somehow that will prolong someone's life or, or keep something from happening. So first, let's look at it really is against our religion, we think. This is, in some ways, the easiest one. Um, a relevant religious objection may have been overlooked earlier in the patient's care. So if you are, have a practice of spiritual screening, taking spiritual histories, or um, having a strong chaplaincy program, it probably would have picked this up. Now maybe if a patient is being transferred and there were breaks in their documentation or somebody other than the patient filled out the form and there's incorrect information, that can happen. So you know they, they've written the patient down as lifelong Lutheran and really they're lapsed unit or something like that, and, and you're, you're talking to them in the wrong language. Um, and there are some patients who need and want specific things to go on in the context of illness and care. So it is important to ask about um, what, uh, especially what the patient wants, not what somebody else thinks the patient ought to want. The family may need something different, maybe, maybe but it is important to, um, one, one of the things that chaplains have to do is protect patients from proselytizing 
and you know from sort of the deathbed conversion scenario. I was in Wyoming last week and I was talking to local clergy from a very a broad range of traditions. And they were talking about some scenarios where you know, the, there were people in the family who said, well, I know they've been a lifelong whatever, but this is what we are. They left our tradition and now, you know, and we, th we want to have them baptized or whatever it may be. And the chaplain's job, if they hear about that, their job is to protect the patient. So it isn't, you're taking care of the family, but first, your allegiance is to the patient. So while you can't control everything that goes on, you know, in people's lives, in people's homes, or whatever it may be, when you're inside of that institution, it's very important to maintain that allegiance to the patient and keep talking about we, we need to do what the patient has told us that they want and what they care about and what they don't want. So that is, that's part of, of spiritual care as well. Um, sometimes patients or surrogates or other loved ones are misinformed about the requirements of the patient's faith tradition. Uh, they may say, well, we're something, therefore we have to have everything. Now, it's unlikely that a religious tradition says every time a new technology comes down to the pike, you have an obligation to use it. So it is important to say, what is it specifically that the, per, the patient or the surrogate thinks the patient needs, and let's go get the, let's go check this. Let's make sure we have some correct information. Now that doesn't mean what you're doing is giving them a quiz about their beliefs or their religious doctrine. You're clarifying a point of information that has to do with medical technology. So um, for to do something like that, you need very well-informed people in your institutions because you don't want misinformation to, to get passed along when, when something just you know needed to be clarified. Again, another good way to use your chaplain. Maybe they can be the one to, to go check that clarification there. Um, another reason for a religious objection, and this is, can be very, very stressful um, for families and for staff, is if this happens, if the patient dies, I will lose my faith. I, not the patient, someone will lose their faith. Uh, for some families, any decision that acknowledges that an end of life may, ne may be near may seem morally wrong, monstrous. Uh, some people may fear that they will lose their own faith as a result. They, they, need to keep, they, they are waiting for a miracle to happen. Maybe they have got their whole congregation praying night and day for the survival of this patient. It's almost as though if the patient dies, it will let the people at the church down, and we can't allow that to happen, or God will let us down, or we'll let God down because our faith wasn't strong enough. This really does happen, and it may happen more often in some parts of the country than in others, but this is a very diverse nation, so you need to be prepared for this almost anywhere. A person of religious faith can also raise, it, raise this sort of objection out of a belief that continuing treatment is morally wrong. We tend to associate this with, um, you have to keep going. But we had an interesting uh, case study in the Hastings Center report a few months ago that was about a Hindu family who said you know, they were, the patient had a lifelong, multiple lifelong disabilities, had never had decision-making capacity, had, had something like 40 hospitalizations in a year, and finally the parents said about their adult son, his soul is trapped. And in our tradition, his soul needs to keep going, and, and we're trapping him in a, in a body that is dying, and we need you to stop. And, and this, it was a hospital nursing home situation, and the nursing home was very nervous about this. But this, this the case study, because, in part because they didn't know very much about the patient's belief system. And so understanding that was important to say, no, no, this is very sincere. They, this is a very ancient tradition, and that is, that, that is what they have come to believe. Um, things are going too fast is another reason uh, that a religious objection may be raised. Um, a, a loved one, perhaps someone who's been peripherally involved or uninvolved, someone who's distant, who may not have come to terms with the patient's prognosis or who has unfinished business with the patient, maybe going back decades, may say this is against our religion to try to challenge the decision-making authority of a patient or a surrogate. You may be seeing a rivalry between adult siblings. You may be seeing somebody who wants to confront the patient one last time and so is basically saying you can't die. Um, you may have somebody who has had a religious conversion of some sort and feels that this is their, this is their role. This can be very scary and disruptive. Doctors worry about this scenario a lot. Sometimes they call it the second cousin from Alaska or California or something. So I know it's always a different state, you know. 
from Ohio, you know. <laughs> And, um, but, but it may not be somebody from far away. It could be another, the adult sibling who didn't get picked to be the surrogate. You know, you know, it could be somebody who's feeling kind of guilty, but kind of you know, left out. It, it, it could be a daughter-in-law who's you know, suddenly saying, wait a minute, obviously all of you people are wrong. Um, you don't know what this family's Thanksgiving dinner has been like for years. You know, <laughs> this may be the latest chapter for all you know. But this, this can happen. And um, so, you know, and, and I, I heard a case the other day. I was giving a talk at Yale, and there was a nurse who was, who was uh, describing a case that had happened that had involved an ethics consultation at her hospital. And it was a case of a, a family member uh, had a son, a son of the patient had left. The family was one very strong religious tradition, a Christian tradition, that the, he had broken with them and joined another tradition. And then he had come in and then said, it's against, our, it's against my religion. And, um, and, and so it replayed the, fa the, the family split. And it was, it was um, and, and also the patient's prognosis had dramatically worsened. So nobody was really prepared for that. So there, were, there was tension from many, many different sources. Um, in these situations, you probably cannot do it all by yourself because you have multiple actors uh, by definition here and a high level of stress. In a situation like this, what should, what should the nurse do? It's really smart to page the chaplain right away. Get them in there, right, get them in their vocabulary in there right away. This is much more productive than waiting until the, 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 uh, the person raising the objection, by definition, is looking at the clinical staff with suspicion, is looking at you doctors, you nurses, you're trying to make us do something. You're, you're trying to, wor to rush us or something like that. So if you get somebody in there, it may take the focus off of, of, of the, the other team members a little bit. Um, so, and, and, and chaplains do tend to be non-confrontational. I, hospice and palliative care nurses, I imagine, t tend to have those skills as well. So you, if you don't have a chaplain available, it may be you doing that, but you, pro you probably need someone else in there to kind of help um, ease the tension a bit. If you've got a chaplain, or if you have another person who's sort of going to address the, re the religious objection, that person should be prepared to discuss the nature of the objection, not just, oh, don't worry, you know, it's really get at what, what are the emotions that are prompting this, and to collaborate with the other team members to, above all, protect the patient's best interests, because that's what everyone has to do. Support whoever the decision maker is, whether that's the patient or whether that is the patient's surrogate, but not suddenly say, oh, the person who has raised the objection is now the person we look to just because they're making the most noise or upsetting people. But we need to provide appropriate care to that person, appropriate care. It may have to happen in another room, but we have to make sure that, that we focus on the patient first and on the decision maker as well because this is a, tends to be a decision making uh, scenario. What else should uh, the, the chaplain or the, or the other spiritual care provider do? Invite those involved to talk about the religious objection, to, to sit down and, and talk about it. Again, not a quiz on doctrine. It's important to find out whether a sincere belief reflects a misunderstanding and, and how do you gently correct, well, actually, you know, the, the, you know, the, the position of your tradition on, the, on this technology is, oh, that I didn't know, okay. Um, you may need to team up with a local clergy to help uh, if, it, if it turns on a, a point like that. Remember that it may not be possible to figure out if a patient shared a surrogate's religious beliefs. So a surrogate be said, well, in my tradition, in our tradition, you may or may not know whether this was at all the patient's tradition. You do have to keep focusing on what would the patient have wanted? What would the patient have wanted? Now, a patient may have always wanted to keep peace in their family. So they may not have said that much about religion, but they may have always wanted to keep peace in their family. So that's part of you know, the story that, uh, that goes along with resolving something like this. But it doesn't mean that the surrogate's own belief system be, uh, get, are imposed on, on the patient in that way. You know, helping to see, you know, what's, again, as a chaplain would say, what's your stuff and what's my stuff is important here too. This can take time. How should you all collaborate with one another? Now, 
Chaplains should know how to address unmet religious needs, which means if a chaplain is on your palliative care team, that's something that you all should be able to rely on the chaplain to do. And if, if not, they need to, to become very comfortable with that. As I mentioned, this may involve collaboration with clergy trusted by the family, which can be a little difficult because you don't know how much that clergy knows about the healthcare context. They may, they may be very well known by, to the family, that family may just have moved into town, and they may have just met this this pastor or, or rabbi or, or whoever it may be. So that could be that can always be a, a, a somewhat um, dicey proposition. But sometimes it's absolutely necessary to do that. Involving clergy in your community education programs is a good idea. Whether or not you you have to. You have to try to figure out when and where they'll show up because their hours aren't the same as your hours. But if you can make it worth their while and really say this is useful to you in your congregational life as well as when you enter our life, you know, here, here, here in the hospital, here in the hospice, here in the nursing home, um, that would be helpful so that you have um, allies in the community. Um, sometimes ethics consultation is necessary, a calling for an ethics consultation. How many of you are institutions where you have and use an ethics consultation service? Okay, so most of you. Who, uh, and those of you who don't, what settings do you work in? Home care. Home care, okay. Yeah, it would be hard. It, 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 there are some, um, I know of one hospital that has a home care division that actually has an ethics committee for its home care division. Um, and, and also has a, a, a sort of a separate code of ethics for home care workers because it didn't make sense to have the home care workers and the doctors, you know, on the same. But um, it, 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 it requires very intentional work to make sure that home care workers have a, a place to go with because you want to you want ethically to be um, ethically sound in your own practice too, and you and you are in a different setting than a lot of others. Um, Conflict resolution, that may be necessary in some of these cases. Some hospitals use a mediation-based approach. Um, sometimes it's having a person who's just good at going around a room and listening to people, but sometimes you just need that something to take uh, some of the tension out of the air. Um, sometimes it's necessary to have legal consultation, especially if the patient is a child um, or is under some other kind of state guardianship arrangements. Um, you, legal may have, there may be some specific things that you have to do um, to make sure that the, this person's rights are protected. Any questions about religious objections or any sin situations that you've encountered? Everybody has a story on this one. Anything? Not feeling like sharing at 8.30, it's okay. Yes, yes. That's a very good question. I, again, it, it, it's, the question was is, do you need permission to bring, a prof, to bring the, a, a, a chaplain who works in your hospital or their own clergy? No, in the hospital. Okay, that's a really good question. Do you need permission to bring a chaplain in? The answer, as in so much in ethics, is it depends. Um, <laughs> Um, the, when, when, I, when I have to write about palliative care, I tend to say that pain and symptom management is, is, is mandatory. The offering pain and, and symptom management is, you can't, you know, you can't not address that. You know, you, can, you want to be able to say to patients, we will take care of your pain. We will take care of your symptoms. Whatever your diagnosis is, whatever, it, if you're 100% chance of being cured, we will take care of your pain and symptoms. It is not some either or business. But I think we have to, we sort of say, we offer people access to other services. We don't say, you must have mental health services. You must have chaplaincy services. You must have social. We tend to offer those things to people. There is something about the different, it's something about medical and nursing care and, and other services that they are sort of different in kind. Um, that, that, and, and also because some of them are about IVs and, and procedures and others tend to be more interpersonal. So we, we don't say, I mean, there are a lot of people who walk into your space when you're in a, in a hospital. So the, the, the patient does have the right to say, no, I don't think so. No, that's, no, I would prefer not to have that, thank you very much. It's like when the cart comes through, would you like, would you like a magazine, would you like arts and crafts? They can say no. Nobody says you have to have the visiting dog you know, in, in your room. You can say, I'm sorry, I'm allergic to dogs, I'm a cat person. Um, but that doesn't mean these aren't very important services that might be very um, 
meaningful. Some people may say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Offering is, 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 is very important. But it, I think it's, it's even easier, it, it much easier, if the chaplain's already on the palliative care team. And the palliative care team is seeing patients in an organized, predictable way. So if the palliative care service is only a referral service, it's already kind of a when is the moment at which we call palliative care. You know, whereas in some hospitals, I think what they have is if a patient is in by a certain number of days, palliative care rounds regardless. And so it's like these are the people who take care of pain and symptoms and your experience as a person. Oh, that's great. I'm so glad you do that. That's wonderful. The family's like you take care of their pain. You care about them as a person. That's wonderful. You know, and it's not you ha- it's not already a crisis situation. And that way you can introduce who, who the people are. That would be the crisis. That's where you've got a crisis, right? Even if, yeah, even if the chaplain is helping the team, it's worth doing. Even if the chaplain is there, like, look, let's try this. Uh, that sometimes a chaplain can come in. I, I got, I, I was talking with a, a chaplain. And she called me at work, and sometimes people call me with these like cases that have gone on for months and months. And even though I'm not a clinician, they think, well, maybe maybe I've got a fresh idea. And it was a case of a patient who had multiple comorbidities. I mean, two forms of cancer and dementia and very many different things. One, sort of a, one of those nursing home IV, ICU cases. One family member in the region. And the family was part of a very small religious tradition. So there was, it, it, and it was, um, it was very patriarchal. And one thing that this chaplain had observed was, she said, you know, when the the more women we brought into the rooms to meet with the, the, with, with the family member, the less he wanted to deal with us. And she, ha, she just noticed that. She noticed it. So piling on more clinicians because uh, he tended to respond uh, more readily to men than to women. Now, this, this, she was not going to change that about him. And, her, and, and what we talked about a lot was that the allegiance had to remain to the patient and to focusing on the patient's needs. So one of the things that the, that chaplain had noticed just from kind of reading the room was saying maybe we have to think a little differently about who is in the room with this family member if we're trying to get him even to come to an appointment, let alone to talk constructively about his um, his his loved one, uh, for whom he is the surrogate. You know, she the patient was completely uh, incapacitated. So sometimes they can be helpful behind the scenes, but they, they can also be, if it's, if it's is really one of these, um, lang- especially religious language about we all, we'll lose our faith, we still, we still have hope, God works miracles, that kind of language, sometimes a chaplain can work with the language uh, fairly comfortably. Um, and, and just, it may not, you know, it may not work. If it doesn't seem like it's gonna work, then it doesn't work. But um, and it's not, and they're not, they're not the miracle worker either. But um, I, if there, if you have professionals who are in your hospital, they are members of your clinical staff. So if they're well integrated into your team, but if there hasn't been a practice of using them, then I could see you might be less comfortable about calling them. Where if you, if you've been working with them, you you can say to the family, look, this is sometimes really helpful to families in your situation. But if you've never seen that. Then you might not know that it would be helpful. But that's offering. I'm saying offering. Right. But don't just bring them in. Right. That's right. You don't bring them in like the cavalry to say, oh well, you know, you know. But but I I doubt that would go over very well. But I would I would I would say bring them in, and and they would say this too. They would say it's hard because they will get paged when it is at a terrible standoff, when things have been going on, like when this call that I got, it had been going on for months and months. And it wasn't getting any better. It wasn't getting any better. So what they would always say is, can you please just, if your inclination is to call us at all, call us earlier rather than later before people's, before people are so suspicious of anyone with a badge that it's hard for us to, to help. Because that's what tends to have happen, that there's a lot of suspicion. What are you trying to make us do? You know, so go a little earlier when, when before any, any battle lines have hardened. But again, you don't have to, it may just be 
talking with the staff. It may just be, look, you know, let's, what's going on here? Has someone just arrived? What are the dynamics here? Did this patient, was this patient just transferred from another hospital? What, what, what happened? Um, did they think that something was going to happen here at the hospital and something hasn't happened? And now they're very upset about that, you know, so, and then that may, so some, some of it may just be a little coaching, you know, and, but whoever has the relationship with the, with the patient or the family is usually the one that is going to be the most effective. Sometimes the relationships can be broken under these very stressful situations, but that's a really good question. Any others? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, I was hoping that you could shed a little bit of uh, light for me about a particular religious tradition. So I'm thinking about Buddhism in particular, and can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, for instance, an objection to uh, pain medication because it might blunt awareness or um, that sort of thing? I just wondered if you uh, could talk a little bit about that with your experience. You know, I don't have... I don't have too much experience directly with patients. Well, there's so many different kinds of Buddhists that I'm not quite sure that any, my very limited experience would, would, would translate. But I, I once had, we have visiting scholars at the Hastings Center. And when I was working on medical error, I, was, I had a chance to talk to a, a, a Japanese cardiologist who, was, who self-identified as Buddhist, for, coming from a Buddhist, tri, a Buddhist culture. And she said, you know, in our tradition, we believe that everyone is connected. And we also believe that suffering is inevitable. So we believe that if you harm me, that you are harmed by the fact that I am suffering, we suffer together, and the word compassion is very important in Buddhism. But then she stopped and she said, but what if the other person doesn't seem to be suffering? Mm -hmm. She said, that doesn't make it easy. I mean, it doesn't like, oh, well, we've just accepted that now. She said, it's just as hard for us sometimes as it can be in another cultural framework. So it was a, just a good reminder, like people are not the same as their traditions. They're, they're always who they are as persons, uh, no matter what their social relationships are. So I think one thing that would be important there with <clears throat> as much as you could find out, what does the patient care about? The patient may say, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a lifelong Buddhist, or maybe I became a Buddhist a few years ago, whatever it may be. Um, in my tradition, we believe that suffering is inevitable. Uh, we believe in compassion. We believe that people are interconnected. We believe, you know, all, but suffering is, is part of life. And yet this patient may also say, well, I, we believe suffering is part of life, but we also believe in analgesic. I mean, you know, or, or rather, it, it, Buddhists do go to, they do have hospitals in Buddhist countries, you yes, know. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, people are more than one thing. And so there are plenty of ways that you're suffering when you're dying. Absolutely. There are plenty of ways that you're suffering when you're dying of cancer. But pain and suffering is the person's experiences, you know, what we t and, and because and it, it's not exactly what's captured on a pain scale, you know, with the smiley faces. But, but I think being clear with a person about um, what they care about, not just their suffering, um, do they want to let more suffering into their life or suffering that is one of the lenses through which they view life, that suffering is inevitable? But also that what, what are the things that pain medication can help them do? What if this patient has said, what I really want to do is sit in my yard. What I really want to do is spend time with my sister. Well, pain medication could allow you to do those things. And that goes to those those questions of connectedness. Right. So religions have more than one tenant as well. So that might be very important to that person or to another person who might not be looking, who might have very similar beliefs, but not identify them with Buddhism. They might say, look, I don't think we get out of this life without suffering. I really, I value being independent and in control of things. Um, and I really want to spend time with my kids. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of channeling an in-law of mine, the way that they would look at this situation. Um, I, you know, that person might also have trepidation about, mm -hmm. about anything that might sedate them or, or, you know, but so explaining it, you know, we're not going to give you more than, you're not going to be out, let's say the person, I don't want to be out of it. Right. Okay. Here's how you can control it. Or here's some different ways that we can work with it. But I think that's very good that the, the religious belief would be a strand mm 
in what the patient, and, it's, and it may offer you a window, so you could say, tell me what that means. But it doesn't, it never dictates what the person is or what the person may want. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. Thank you, it's a great question. Okay, hi, um, I just wanna share one quick story. I received a call one morning from a nurse that was very distressed working in the ICU. Patient uh, of hers had, uh, she had coded five times, not exaggerating, during the night. Uh, patient had a long history of cardiac disease, and the nurse was very upset because the family wanted to continue with full resuscitation, keep going, keep going, keep going. Please come help, <laughs> one of those calls. So the chaplain and I showed up and met with the patient's daughter, and she's telling us the story about how wonderful the mother was, took out a picture of her in a gown, had all this wonderful, wonderful things to say about the mother and said, she's just so upset, doesn't know what to do. She's waiting for a sign from God to tell her what to do. <laughs> Thank God the chaplain was sitting there. And he looked at her and he said, perhaps he already has. <laughs> and that's all he had to say. Later that day, uh, we met with the other adult children, and the patient was allowed a natural death later on that day. And if it wasn't for him and those words that he said, um, we don't know where this story would have ended up, but it was amazing how he said that, and everything just stopped at that point. And just wanted to share that with you. Thank you, that's, 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 a, that's a really <laughs> wonderful and helpful story. But again, it's that sort of, it's that, that, I mean, chaplains have a lot of training. They do many, many hours of clinical training. So they're, they're familiar with the technology. But they're also, you know, they also have seminary training and they're part of a, a religious tradition and they do a lot of group work. So something buddy like that is, 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 is tapping into taking what the family is saying seriously and taking what the patient is saying seriously and saying, okay, well, you know, what, what, if, what if this is... Oh, 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 okay, and 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 um, but you can also see it takes the you know the tension out of things going in one particular direction. Whereas, because if if the thought was that suddenly the patient would get up and walk or something like that, that wasn't exactly what they were saying. But it sounded like um, a, a situation in which the family was trying to figure out how they were going to live with the consequences of what happened, and you know part of what. Um, the clinical team is, is, is sometimes doing is saying, here is a, a way that, uh, that, that in, a, in a sense, you're going to remember this. You know, they'll probably remember that moment, and they'll talk about that moment. Um, and, you know, the word closure does not work for a lot of people, um, or, you know, at, at all, at all. Um, and, um, but it is a way of saying this is what is going on. And some, again, sometimes that type of presence can be, just be helpful and can quiet things down because, you know, what you're usually aiming for is, is some peace and not su such conflict. Um, but that's a, that's a terrific story. So I'm glad that was helpful. Um, anything else? Any, I have any? a question. Oh. Um, you, we were talking earlier about the allegiance to the patient, and what would you do in a situation where your patient does not want any chaplain, spiritual care, and they make it adamant at the first visit, I don't want anybody involved, they don't want you contacting their family, they don't want anything, what do you do for that? Well, what, what do you do? I mean, of course, and then the, you say to the patient, we'll respect your wishes. That's the first thing you do is you show them respect, and you say, then you won't have any. That's, that's, I mean, it, unless you want it, you don't have to have it. That's okay. And this, this, you know, this person may have had a very, some very bad experiences. Maybe they left home to escape some very bad experiences. So, or maybe this is just a, this is a very private person. Well, I guess my question is, you know, you, and you were saying it before about the family and having such right. a crisis going on and really having, right. needing somebody to help facilitate that. Right. A lot of time, you know, I actually have a patient that, that kind of went through this. And I guess my question is, you know, like, I, that's what we did respect what the patient wanted, right. but it was a very difficult, you know, it's a very difficult transition for the family. Right. And so how do you, you know, who do you get involved to help with that? Now, is this case one where the patient doesn't want anybody and the family is there? Yes. There's family there? Yes. The pa so the, but the, well, 
The patient, the patient told me that um, he absolutely had no use for religion That's whatsoever. Fine. That's and fine. And he did not want any you know, part of it in his home, around his family, That's and nothing. That's fine. Um, can I ask, what is the age of the patient? 78. Okay, so his, his family's grown up. Mm -hmm. They can sort of decide what they need for themselves, right? Sure. Okay, because the, they're people too. <laughs> um, you're obviously, your first obligation is to the patient and the patient's wishes about the patient's care. But when you are caring for, this is that tension that we have between patient-centered and family-centered. Mm -hmm. um, the family may need things that the patient doesn't need or doesn't want, uh, just like the family doesn't need opioids. I mean, maybe but it sounds do nice, sure. but they don't need them, you know. Okay. You might think that. Okay. <laughs> No, um, but, but my question is, like, you know, if they're in a home situation and you're taking care of this patient right. and here's this family and they do need the help and they right. want support, how do you facilitate that because you can't do it there? You can't you do it. Can't, you, you can't it, it does, that. It would not appear that you could do this in front of the patient because right. what the patient, you know, now also the, always a useful thing, and I'm sure as palliative care providers you really know how to do this, can you switch the focus to what we can do for you? to what we, what we can't do for you, you know, or what you don't want us to do. What do you want us to do? And this patient may say, I want a grilled cheese every day, and it's on rye bread, or whatever it is. Or, you know, there is, you know, you know chocolate ice cream, you know, not that vanilla pudding. What, what is this thing that the patient wants, as opposed to, now the patient has said what they don't want. And sometimes that changes. Sometimes that changes. But at the moment, they're, they're letting you know what they don't want, and that's that's good that they do that. And you know something, a chaplain will never be offended by that. They're like, oh, that's fine. That person may have had terrible scarring experiences. Fine, I don't want to trigger any of that. And they'll make a note. There'll be a note that you know, just that's not that's not a room that you know wants these particular services. Um, but um, what does that patient want? What what's helpful to them? Um, and when we get into existential suffering, there may be some things that may be going on there that uh, might be helpful. Now, it could put more pressure on you because that's, those are fewer resources that you have to call on. If this person's saying, I don't want to talk to anybody, I don't want to talk about my feelings, I don't want to talk about God, okay, no mental health, no, you know, there's all of these things suddenly you can't use. Um, but, so that means nursing is going to be hugely important. Um, primary nursing may be helpful. Maybe this patient, there could be some continuity in the form of the nursing staff or something like that. But the family, if they're saying, please, please, we need someone to talk to, we're, we, well, again, they want to talk about their own things too. It's going to be complicated because if you have a capacitated patient who is making their decisions, mm -hmm. That has also got to be clear to the family. If, they, if, if by a clinical evaluation this patient has capacity and the family is saying, no, no, we have to make decisions, dad's wrong. But it's like, but dad's got decision-making capacity. So dad, you know, so they may have to be deal with their own feelings, whether there was an estrangement in the family. You may never know. You're just dealing with what you have. But there, it, it's okay to provide some services to the family as long as the family understands the patient does not want these for himself and the patient does not want this brought into his room by anyone. You know? It's hard, but that's, you know, it, and it really helps if you've got some separate spaces that you can go and talk with people about these different things. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Oh, yes. So just wanted to share a story of existential suffering. Um, had a patient who suddenly went from really being involved with the spiritual community, was Roman Catholic, the priest would come every day, and suddenly he wanted nothing to do with it after mm -hmm. a history of 75 years. And um, couldn't quite figure out where distress was coming from. And he kind of started becoming more nonverbal and more internalizing and, and, you know, some of those isolation behaviors. And the family was really upset. And now the nurses were more involved with the spiritual domains of right. care. Mm -hmm. And every night the patient would um, either have sundowners or agitation and couldn't quite put your finger on it. Well, um, on rounding one night, the patient was under his covers. And um, upon assessment, um, asked him, well, what are you, it seems like you're communicating fear. Um, tell, tell us more about that. A very skilled nurse had done this. And um, he said, well, Satan 
has decided to come get me. And he said, I didn't know that I was going to go that way. And uh, there, we're doing construction on the hospital, and there was a bat oh. that would come into the room oh. at night. Oh. And it was a real bat. So spiritual reality, existential suffering, all together symbolized in a bat coming down. How important for that nurse to acknowledge and be involved with the spiritual care domains. So I just wanted to share that story because it was days of suffering. Yes. Oh, what, what a brilliant story. Thank you so much, especially since hospitals are always under construction. Uh, <laughs> you know, and again, sometimes the answer is really obvious. I mean, but again, he was seeing it at night. When do bats come out? I myself am terrified of bats. Um, I would not have liked that. And, 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 um, for, and you know, as you said, days of suffering Ha, and, and, and to the patient, the patient may or even if somebody had been there, unless you saw the bat, if somebody, if somebody in this patient's condition started talking about a bat, might somebody believe him that he was talking about a real bat? Yeah, yeah so even he, oh, yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's a really good story, and maybe you should write a little, write that up for the literature, because that's quite an amazing, amazing story. And just never overlooking anything. Yes, you know, so br brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. Yes. I have a story of a, a young man that I had. He was married with a couple of children, and he was dying from liver cancer from his uh, alcoholism. So we had the DNR down in the corner bar and the whole thing, you know, and um, I kept asking him, you know, do you want to minister? Do you want to pre? You know, do you want to talk about God at all? And it was always, no, no, there's no such thing, there's no such thing. So one night I get away from, I get a call from his wife, and she says, he's just uncontrollable. And I'm like, well, I'll give him a little more Thorazine, you know. <clears throat> she says, spiritual distress, and he'll be all right, and blah, blah, blah. So she calls me a couple hours later, and she goes, he's getting worse, and he's screaming, Satan's in the room, get him out. And I was like, oh, my God. So I called my, my boss, and she goes, well, I'm at Carlisle's, but he probably is in the room. And I'm like, okay, thanks, Kathy. <laughs> so, so I went and made a visit, and this guy, I mean, we had to give him, we gave him enough medications to kill five people, and he just thrashed and moved and screamed. And finally, we took some sheets and kind of tied him to the bed a little bit so that, you know, he wouldn't hurt himself or anyone else. So... He started screaming to me again, Satan's in the room, get him out. So I'm like, okay, go get your rosaries and I'm calling the minister, you know. So she got her rosaries and we started praying. She was a very devout Catholic. And uh, the minister came and he prayed and we all kind of prayed together. And he seemed to calm down. And in the morning, she called me about 5.30, which wasn't many hours later. And uh, she said to me, I think he's going to pass. So I came over, and I was holding his hand, and I was checking for a pulse. And this guy was laying in the bed, and he was so beautiful. He must have made his decision to go with God, and um, he just laid there in like a um, fetal position, and he just kind of glowed, and you know, it was so wonderful to see that transition in that man, and you know how good God really is, and it's just a neat story. So. Thank you, thank you. Again, you probably, in a patient in that situation, you may never have known what, what had happened in his life, what demons or whatever it may be, but something about that language and iconography was meaningful to to him in some way. Just as I should say, uh, the um, AA can be a very powerful, um, religion for some people, and that may be what, uh, some pe how some people communicate their uh, senses of meaning in life. And, it, and, and But they'll probably also want to make sure that you understand what that means. You know? So if, if, uh, that's an important thing to learn about, and I'm sure many of you have had experience with that too. Anything else? Great. Thank you so much for these stories.
Okay, so let's look at existential suffering, also sometimes known as existential distress. Now, the thing about the, these words is that there is no consensus definition of them. There's a big literature, but nobody precisely agrees what we're talking about. Um, it usually refers to suffering that is not relieved by the treatment of physiological symptoms or that occurs in the absence of symptoms. You could have a patient who has no physiological pain or whose pain is controlled. They, on the pain scale, they're down at the, the low end, and they are still saying, I am absolutely suffering in, in some way. Um, it, it may be uh, the prospect of death, the fear of a health crisis, maybe a hemorrhage, something like that. I'm so terrified that this thing will happen. It has consumed everything else. I don't care that you're managing things now. That's what I'm afraid of. Uh, alienation, I'm all by myself here. Profound loneliness, you know, that those broken connections, loss of meaning. Uh, I'm stuck in this body, in this bed. My life, me as a person, means nothing anymore. And why am, I, why am I bothering to be alive? Why am I bothering to be conscious? So that is how this, the person is so out of sync with the idea of being a person almost. Um, it can be experienced by a religious person, a non-religious person. It's not, um, it, it, unless the person frames it in terms of religion or spirituality, that's not necessarily what it should be uh, confused with. Um, we don't want to use the word existential to mean the human condition, the tragedy of life. Um, we may have take, studied uh, existentialism in college, but we don't want to use those very general terms um, because it could, what we need to find out is what are the particular sources of suffering for this particular person. Um, we also don't want to confuse it with moral distress. I know Nessa Coyle talked about that yesterday. And sometimes these, you know, these terms get a little confused with one another. And I, I heard someone recently, uh, they were referring to existential distress and they meant moral distress. And moral distress is something that happens uh, to healthcare professionals when they feel that uh, they are being prevented from doing the right thing or forced to do the wrong thing. And, um, and they believe that they cannot stop what is going on. So that's a, another sort of a textbook definition. But this is, this is something that when we're talking about it, we're usually talking about a patient. Okay, so it demands a response. It's real suffering. It's not the tragedy of life. It is not the tragedy of death. Something's going on with this person. The man with the bat in the room needed the bat out of the room. You know, he was probably suffering a lot less when the bat squad, you know, showed up. Um, Attentiveness to the existentially distressed patient is crucial. It's also not easy because the person may, may have difficulty articulating what, what is wrong here and, and, and all the traditional things are not working. A psychiatric consultation can help determine if there's a treatable condition uh, that is contributing to the patient's suffering because if you just were looking for physio physiological pain and symptoms, you might miss uh, profound insomnia. For example, if this patient is saying, I haven't slept in three days, and there's construction going on, and there's jackhammering, there may be a reason why they haven't slept in three days. And if you have chronic insomnia, you feel absolutely terrible. You don't just feel tired, you feel out of sync with life. Like you can't do anything and think, and you think, I will never sleep again. You know, and uh, so it's not a pleasant feeling. And it can also trigger things like anxiety. It's just an awful feeling. So maybe there's a way to alleviate that. Maybe you, you know, if this patient's very near the end of life, that may limit you know, how much you can do toward some things that have a longer course of treatment, but always a good idea to have a psychiatric consultation to see, you know, is there something else here that we can modify? Um, environmental factors, lack of privacy. The, uh, this, I'm in a double room and the other person's TV is always on. I'm a vegetarian and this person is ordering meat and it's making me sick and I can't stand it and I hate that that part of me isn't being respected right now. Like little things like that, but it takes time to get this uh, out of someone. Uh, check for this. Um, maybe a, pay, a person w wants to be near a window and they can't see out, and it's really bothering them that they're just staring at fluorescent lights. Um, is there anything th that this patient could control themselves that they would like to have some control over? Um, that, would be, you know, that, that would be something to check on.
Um, again, letting the chaplain know is not never a bad idea because they're good at listening, and it may take a while to find out what what is uh, so distressing to this patient. Um, primary nursing can be important because if one of the disruptions that the patient is feeling is nobody here knows my name, I ha they keep asking me the same questions. I just feel like a thing here. If there's one nurse who whenever they're on duty can say I know you you know me I'm on for the next you know three nights or whatever and then this that gives some continuity to this situation it's somebody who knows me and that that may be helpful um, now there is a, a, a debate in the literature about whether or not palliative sedation is um, appropriate as a means of, re uh, of uh, addressing um, um, existential suffering that cannot be um, addressed in any other way, or, um, or that apparently cannot be addressed in any other way. Now, palliative sedation, um, where there is agreement on palliative sedation, um, it involves a dying patient with refractory physiological symptoms uncontrollable pain, uncontrollable vomiting, un something that is not responding to anything else, and that the patient is quite near death. On average, it's, the patient is one to, three, lives one to three days. The lack of, a cons if we don't um, have consensus around what existential suffering is, it's hard to know where it fits in all of this. Um, also, it is hard to draw these hard lines between this is physiological, this is psychological, this is existential. Because as we've seen existential suffering can result from physiological suffering that is not presenting itself as pain, but is presenting itself as anxiety or insomnia or something like that. Um, or it could be coming from an environmental factor or a psychological factor, whatever it may be. So we, we, may, we may not be able to definitively rule out that this patient has no physiological symptoms. Um, now, some uh, clinicians and other scholars would argue that palliative sedation would relieve this patient's suffering because it would reduce their awareness uh, so greatly. Um, others argue that that would then reduce their potential for social interaction because of the sedation, and that as social support may be the thing that can repair some of this sense of the broken meaning, um, we, you might be missing an opportunity if you went for the sedation when primary nursing, if that were available, might have been the thing that relieved the suffering. So it might be an overkill situation. Or just not real, the patient may not be asking to be sedated. They may be saying, I don't know why I'm alive anymore. I don't have any sense of being connected to other people. Perhaps that is what a patient is saying. So. It's important that clinician education talks about these debates. So it doesn't, well, never, always, we should do this, we should do that. But it says, well, no, these are debates. Uh, part of them turn on the difficulties of definition. Um, and, and so um, are different people in the room working from different definitions? So that's always good if you were, if you were having um, some staff training on this. Hey, what do you know about this? What do you know about existential distress? What do you know about palliative sedation? What does the literature actually say? So is there a house definition that is so different from what, what, what a particular article is arguing for? Where are there consensus statements? Are, are, are there consensus statements in your field or are there not? Um, so that's, that's important. Um, and it helps clarify information for clinicians, but it also helps promote um, clear communications when you're talking with patients um, and surrogates. Um, I did a, a case commentary a few years ago for uh, the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, and, and there were two cases that hinged, on, were cases where patients requested palliative sedation um, in cases of existential suffering. One had a necrotic wound, and the other was just fed up, I think. Um, but um, it, and in both cases, they said, no, no, we can't do that. We can only treat your, your pain, and we've treated your pain. Um, and what's, what it seemed to be that in both cases, when the patients were, um, at the time of admission, were told, we will do whatever is necessary to treat your suffering. We will offer you this. And, and then when it came down to the patient just thought they were asking for what they had been told they could ask for. So there was a break in just the basic communications about, about how this particular facility used different interventions. Um, and, so, and, it, and it also was a little confusing for the family to say, so you, you'll offer the patient sedation for this, but not for that, and I'm not quite understanding how these things are different from one another. So um, that's you know, using some cases and saying, now how, how would we respond? How did we respond? 
What is our policy? Um, how do we feel about these situations? You know, um, is really important uh, for it, for um, good clinical practice, for good communications, and also so that you don't wind up with a moral distress situation that somebody feels that they are being prevented from doing the right thing or failing to do, you know, the right thing, um, because of just because of a, a, a muddle about communications. Any questions about this? About any of these issues? Yes. Well, I think probably, well, the, the, both the uh, VA and the NHPCO have policy statements on this. Yeah. So you, you uh, and again, because there is debate around this, a very active debate, or, or, well, there's, there's, there's consensus around some areas of palliative sedation and not other areas. With respect to existential suffering, the lack of a consensus definition means it's called a lot of different things, and the term is used kind of loosely. So one thing I think is important is to say, when a statement on palliative sedation addresses existential suffering, for example, what, how does it define that? So what is in relation to what? But the VA has had a policy for several years, and I would think that in a VA system, you would want to you know, work the policy and figure out, okay, how does this apply to, to our circumstances? It, it's very clear. They took it as a number of different cases. Like, for example, um, sedation during extubation is sedation, and you could say it's palliative in, intent, but it's not the same thing as sedating a patient to unconsciousness for days because you're expecting that patient to die quite soon, and what you're doing is sedating any distressing effects of the, of the extubation. But any guidance on, on that would say you have to have a plan for it. I mean, any sort of palliative sedation, any use of sedation for palliative purposes is never just turning things up. You know, just because that's not a plan. I mean, that's, you know, you're not actually figuring out what's the level you need, uh, at what level was symptom relief achieved, what, what can you learn from this, in other words, about how to provide good care. Um, and, and you're in a system where you have a lot of residents, so the training part of it is always very important, what lessons are being learned. But I would start with um, your, the VA's own policy, and I would also see whether or not this National Center for Ethics and Healthcare, which is a VA resource that is available to anyone, some of your things are only for the VA, but a lot of their publications are put up on their website and it's free. Um, I would see if they have any curriculum on this or they do teleconferences. Let's see, see if they have anything. On, on that, and, and that may help you to say, well, this is practice in other VA hospitals, or let's, what can we learn from a like hospital, or something like that. Is that helpful? Yes, it is. Great, great. I just have a quick story I'd like to share, sure. um, because I don't know how to comfort this patient. Um, she's a young woman with relapsed AML. Um, she was originally diagnosed 2006, went through a bone marrow transplant, and I meet her relapsed and she's a Roman Catholic, and she asked me for a priest. And so I found a priest to come and you know, be at her bedside, and I happened to be outside her room, and I heard her say, Father, can you tell me why I'm suffering so much? Can you tell me why my cancer's back, and why do I have to go through this? And the priest said to her, well, you are divorced. <laughs> Which is her religion, and this suffering then I, I couldn't reach because the suffering was complicated by her own um, leader of her religion. So how could I have provided comfort to that person? Well, um, uh, that's, tr that's a tragedy. Um, and I think it goes to the, the pr uh, previous discussion, which is be out in the community and know you're asking to come in. You know, you know just like... Yeah. By, by virtue of wearing a badge, it doesn't mean that you're a good communicator, you're compa absolutely not. That's why internally it's very important to say, are, are we all real palliative care providers here? You know, are we, are, are, and are we regularly reflecting on what we're doing? The same thing that you're not grabbing somebody off a list, or a but to say, maybe there's even an obligation to, to be part of some community education events if you're going to come in. Now, it's hard when it's the person's own or the family's this own. This was the, the hospital visiting chapter I of would, the day. Uh, I would most definitely bring that to the attention of the ethics Oh, yeah, the first thing we did was call everybody else in, yeah. the chaplain. The, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 because that, that is, um, that's terrible. That's a tragedy. And, and, that and I could not provide comfort for her no, anymore. No, no, no. But it, no, uh, no, what could you do except 
you know, try to pick up the pieces. Tell but, us she had the wrong religion. Oh, well, you can't yeah. really. <laughs> That's, that's going to be a problem later, you know, but, uh, you know, that, that's not going to work for her either right now. But, um, but um, you, you would have to get someone else in there to, to try to, because, but um, it's, um, that person should not have been there because they were not sensitive to the healthcare environment and to what is actually being asked by a dying person. So I guess that is a cautionary tale. About yes. who you're inviting in. Right. To and, and I should add, and because and we're pretty much at time now, but I just wanted to, we won't do any case studies, but um, a couple of, um, uh, I think you have this in your packet, the slides. Um, there are some further readings or some of the pieces that I mentioned. Um, and um, I'm, I just want to see if there's a particular one here. Um, no, I'll just have to give it to you. Um, uh, Martha Jacobs, A Clergy Guide to End-of-Life Issues. This is written by a very experienced board-certified chaplain for local clergy who do not have this training. Very concrete, because she found in her doctoral research that when clergy t tended to talk about end-of-life care, they were talking about f giving funerals, doing you know things like that, rituals. But they were no more comfortable with the idea of death and dying and mortality than anyone else. Uh, uh, her last name is Jacobs, first name Martha, and it's called A Clergy Guide to End-of-Life Issues. So it's written, it's very practical. It would probably work for other, you know, maybe, you know, just how, how to, if you were, if you were pre preparing a talk for like a, like a spiritual care community locally, it might remind you how to, a good ways to phrase, frame things. Um, and it's, it's in paperback. It just came out last year. Um, another uh, piece that is really uh, helpful is the Thomas Smith uh, Giving Honest Patients to Advance Cancer Maintains Hope. Uh, Thomas Smith is an oncologist and a palliative care clinician. And this was, uh, he was writing for clinical oncologists about their own feelings about being hopeful people and givers of hope and uh, not uh, providing full prognostic information to patients because they feared taking away hope. And he said, now, wait a minute, is, is this real? And what he did was he talked with patients with advanced cancer and surveyed them and found that their sources of hope came from sources other than um, the results of a particular tr uh, trial or whatever it may be. And he said, you know, one of the things we find out is because people as persons get their sources of hope from a number of different places, we have to see whether is this really our own disinclination to talk with them about this. We're fearing we're doing something to them that we're not doing, but we're harming them by not letting them, giving them the information they need to plan how they're gonna live the rest of their lives. So it's a wonderful short uh, article, a good discussion piece. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I wanna just put a few little things next year. This will be out next year. Every 25 years, we think we should uh, revise the Hastings Center guidelines. Um, Betty Farrell and Nessa Coyle were both members of our working group. Uh, so uh, it's very much infused with, uh, with uh, all, all of the values of, of uh, your specialty. And uh, just that's our website. There's a lot of publications written for the palliative care and the hospice community, and many of them are free. So you can just uh, go to our website. Thank you very much.